Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Chris, thanks for taking the time out to join us on the show. Hi, Owen. How are you? That's, I'm very well, mate. It's always good to see you and speak with you. Um, this is the first time our listeners will have heard from you. Um, they've probably seen some of your ETFs and, and know the business that you run. But perhaps you can just tell listeners and myself a little bit about yourself and, and how you came to be the CEO of the business and ETF Securities today. Yeah, great. I, I'll try and keep it short. Um, as you said, my name's Chris Wellsby, um, and I've been in the ETF industry um, about, um, well, at least a decade, maybe 12 or 13 years now. So um, I'm in my mid-40s, and I, I was an accountant uh, mm-hmm. in a bank um, for a long time, um, both in England and in Australia, and uh, I hated it. So um, I changed my career course um, in my early 30s, and I did a master's in finance. Um, and it's actually a funny story, but there was a lady in front of me in an IT course when I was doing a master's, um, and she was applying for this job. So it was on the internet. I looked at it um, and just applied for the same job. Didn't know anything about the company. It was a company called Barclays Global Investors, which is now BlackRock. Mm-hmm. Uh, for a division within it called iShares, um, and I had some of the skills. So I actually applied as just uh, filling time through a lecture, um, which seemed like everyone else was doing, hence why I was uh, copying this woman. Um, and I got an interview for the um, job um, and yeah, came on this fast track uh, master's MBA program into iShares in Europe. Um, and at that time, there was probably maybe 40 or 50 people um, in iShares in Europe. So this is 2007. Um, ETFs, for those who don't know what ETFs are, are, we'll obviously get into that. But ETFs at that time, it was not a done deal. ETFs uh, are part of the financial ecosystem now. But then, especially in Europe, in America, they were already starting to build up. But in Europe, they were still very much in their infancy. I, I don't think that they were going away, but it was still an even bet as to whether they were going to be big or not, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And actually, I started the year after the guys in iShares had been promoted from being in the cellar. So the iShares team had been put in the cellar of this building. Um, You know, there's like 10 of them. They were just put in the cellar, no windows, et cetera, et cetera. So they'd only just been moved up into the uh, first floor of the building we were in. Uh, But yeah. Um, I started at iShares, the credit crisis came, um, the GFC, uh, and uh, ETFs became the net beneficiary of um, a lot of the negative outcomes of the credit crisis. Um, Mm -hmm. So uh, I stayed there for four years, five years. I moved to ETF Securities, uh, which is the company I'm at now, but it's a European division, Um, basically in sales roles and trading roles. Um, I moved to a company called uh, PowerShares, which is the ETF division of Invesco. Um, And finally, the ETF securities team um, in London uh, wanted me to come out to Australia. So I came out here in 2015 um, to start a franchise which was jointly owned between ETF securities and ANZ. Um, ANZ then subsequently sold their share back to ETF securities because Shane Elliott, who I'm sure many of the viewers know, is the CEO of ANZ. He had different views on wealth management and, and a lot of the big bank CEOs have done the same. They sold their wealth divisions. So we have sold as part of that. Um, so we've been in ETF Securities for about two or three years, um, just as one unit. But actually ETF Securities has been around in Australia since 2003. Um, and not to take up too much of your time, but that's an interesting story in itself because... ETFs in Australia have been around since about 2000, but ETF Securities is actually the second provider after State Street, which is an American uh, company. Um, So Graham Tuckwell, who's an Australian, who's now actually returned to Australia after being 15 years in Europe, but he built the first gold ETF in the world. 
Um, that's the same one that's on the Australian Stock Exchange right now. Uh, the ticker is easy to remember. It's G-O-L-D. Um, but he, you know, that again um, was a completely innovative concept at the time. And he had to fight very hard with the ASX and ASIC, the, you know, the exchange and the regulator to allow that product to come onto the exchange where you as an investor buy ETF units, but you're effectively buying real physical gold stored in, in a vault, right? That concept, which is quite known now um, and accepted, and the fund is doing exceptionally well during these volatile times, but that was completely innovative. He then went to Europe and built a much bigger asset manager, which he's recently sold, but he's kept us as one of his, uh, you know, uh, portfolio of companies that he has but it's a story of an Australian done well um, uh, and he's now Graham Tuckwell is now doing a lot of philanthropy uh, particularly with ANU in Canberra. Mm. It's it's quite a story both your own and that of the business um, and then to top it off with knowing that ETF Securities was the first gold ETF provider in the world and to see it it's done so well we're just talking off air about how successful that particular ETF has been it's kind of opened the door, not just for your business, but for the industry, I guess, to, to allow investors to get exposure to different things that they might not otherwise have done so easily and, and, and such a cost. But I think we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Why don't we, why don't we for our listeners, because you're the expert here, I feel like what would be really good, um, most of our listeners know what uh, an ETF is and I guess the basics, but maybe we can just, you can explain what it is and then um, how, you, how you as the ETF provider go about giving, that, giving us an exposure to something like gold. Yeah, so yeah, best to start from um, first principles. And I hope over time uh, you and me um, can talk to your viewers more about this and sort of build on the story. But, you know, anything with a miss, you, you know, like an abbreviation like ETF, most people sort of step back and just go, okay, there's something, you know, uh, complicated uh, going on there. But actually, if you just spell out the name exchange traded fund, which is what an ETF is, it is really that. It's a fund that trades on the ASX um, or uh, an alternative company called ChiX, but basically it's on an exchange. Um, the benefits of that, I guess, uh, just depend on what, what you want from, from benefits is that you can, rather than getting an end of day price, which is what a lot of investors do when they buy active funds uh, or managed funds, which are mainly active funds. Um, you basically put in an order, you wait, and then the next day someone delivers you uh, your units, right? Here, you're actually able to buy here and now at a price that's the actual price here and now. But a lot of Australian investors, that, that particular benefit is secondary to what, uh, you, you know, the fund part of the exchange tradability is. So let's just concentrate on the fund. Most ETFs in Australia are what we call passive instruments. So passive, um, again, like a complicated expression, but basically it's tracks an index. So uh, the, the first ETF ever in, Aust in Australia was by State Street and it tracks the ASX 200. So what that really means is that um, you know investors who don't want to particularly pay, take specific stock bets um, or they want to complement their stock bets with just an index tracker. Um, they buy the ETF from State Street and there's now iShares and, and BeatShares, two other providers that offer the same exposure. But what you're really saying there is an investor, you, you're not, um, you know, it's not so much confidence, but you're, you're saying to, to, to yourself, well, I don't know that I can always pick the right companies. I know that some companies go down very, very heavily um, if they get it wrong. So rather than just having only BHP and Rio and the big four um, and CSL, what I'm also going to do is put some of my money into the ASX 200 um, and this fund will basically track whatever the main index is doing. It won't do more and it won't do less. Um, so if Australia goes up, then I get the benefit of that. Um, and that basic concept has really taken over because uh, what I've just described is by, by far the most basic component of it. But it just means that you can, um, if you think about uh, not putting all your eggs in one basket, that's what really ETFs are. They're, 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 they're meant for sort of broad exposures. So we talked about the ASX 200. But a lot of Australian investors use it for things like yield. So they will buy 
an exchange traded fund that uh, tries to tries to put 40 or 50 companies into one basket. So you're not picking just the banks. You're not just picking, you know, big utility companies that will pay you, you know, like Telstra that will pay you dividends. You're basically saying, well, I'm not sure which one's best. I'll pick 50 via this one fund. Mm -hmm. And uh, a big thing for, for your uh, viewers, Owen, is international as well, right? Even if you know a lot about Australia as an Australian, which you will do, um, knowing what's happening offshore is harder because you're off time zone. You're not walking down the streets and seeing the same companies as you do here when you see ANZ and Westpac on the corners, et cetera, et cetera. Your knowledge is uh, just by virtue of distance, just less. So rather than trying to pick companies offshore, you can use an ETF to get exposure to you know, the FANGs, uh, technology, America, Europe, um, and that's just by region. You can also do it by asset class, so you can do it equities um, or bonds or you know um, commodities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a very, very broad range of ways for investors to limit their risk when they're investing. Mm. It's it's just as you said, it's almost from many different perspectives. It just makes a lot of sense for people, and particularly for people. And and I imagine there are many in our audience who are in this category where they've They've started investing, so they have their share brokerage account and they may have opened it, put a little bit of money in and they've, they've been investing for a little while, but they don't yet really have the confidence to go about picking their own shares or even necessarily have the inclination to do that. So some of them would be, I guess, less inclined to spend time in their computer screen looking at their share portfolio and they'd rather be out walking the dog or spending time with friends or what have you. And so ETFs, are still a fantastic way to to bridge that gap because in the past a lot of people would think well i'm not into share trading and i think it's risky um so i'll just keep my money in the term deposit but now in 2020 we have this total different state of affairs where it's almost imperative that everyone invests and lo and behold here we have these things called etfs which are really picking up and are really i guess um, useful for people and they, and they do the job well of providing them exposure to a basket of, of different things. So one of the things that you and I wanted to talk about um, was, I guess, how you put all of these things together, because you mentioned there that you've got commodities and you've got shares or equities, and then you've got international shares and you can do commo like other commodities like gold, or silver, then you can do different sectors. Like it's a lot for people to take in, right? Like it's, yeah. it's like you go to the supermarket and there's 50 different baked beans. You don't, you, if you just think they're all the same, you don't know exactly what the difference is and how they come together. So why don't we just start at the very basics? If, if I was an investor setting out um, on this journey, I think you've got a really neat concept here, which is one that I come across too, and you did a webinar on it recently, which I'll put in the show notes, is this idea of a core and a satellite. So can you explain to that and maybe some of the things that fit in the buckets and how that plays in with risk profiles and that type of thing? Yeah, okay. So typically our investors are SMSF um, holders. So, you know, they've taken ownership of some of their own uh, direction on their, 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 their future retirement or they might be retired, right? So just for the simplicity of this, let's just assume that there are two types of investors. There are retirees, people who are already retired, um, and their main motive is protection of their asset base because if they lose, they might have to come out of retirement, which is the worst possible scenario to have to go back to work in your mid-60s, you know, 70s, etc. Or at the other spectrum, let's imagine someone who's like in their early 30s um, and, you know, beginning to save, they have their superannuation coming in anyway, and any additional money they're looking for the uh, for the future. So hopefully I'll be able to deal with both uh, risk mm -hmm. profiles. Uh, we, and, and then the concept of core satellites. So core is where you um, basically have your, literally the core of your portfolio, which is probably going to be um, around 80% of your portfolio. Um, and this is, to put it bluntly, it should be relatively boring and safe, um, mm -hmm. where you're trying to make within your own risk profile, so for the younger person, they would probably have a bit more um, excitement within that boringness, so to speak. Um, but for you know someone who's in their retirement, um, they would they would be taking a very very safe um, you know uh, pathway um, within that. But the core uh, core satellite. So when we when we talk about these things, let me take the uh, the retiree first. So 
your core uh, at this point should be not so much um, you know stocks so you will still probably still have stocks if you're an SMSF holder um, and you may have held them for many years and done if you're in Australia done particularly well because many of the big mm. Um, ASX 50 names have done very well over the past uh, 20 years. There's not many examples that weren't um, around um, 20 years ago, uh, with the exceptions of the afterpays, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in reality, um, you are taking a lot of risk having a lot of stocks in your SMSF. So typically, if you went to an advisor, they would say to you, if you're in your 70s, you should have term deposits. Uh, you've already covered the point that term deposits are not as attractive as they used to be or what's called fixed income um, or bonds, which is where, you know, you're basically getting set amounts of money through for the investment you put in. Um, and their risk is much lower than stocks and companies, right? Now, ETFs can help you with that because even then, right, um, setting aside the term deposits, but the fixed income side of things, right, you, you as an investor, you want to buy bonds, you want to buy fixed income exposures, you can go to your bank and they can set you up with something. It's normally very uh, like high rates um, in, in, fact, in terms of what they charge you to do that. Or you can buy an ETF, um, ETF securities. We don't have any um, at the moment of these fixed income ones, but you know, iShares, BeatShares, Vanguard, um, you know, Panic, these main companies in Australia, they all have them. Um, and rather than you picking one bond, uh, like an Australian government bond, you know, a 10-year government bond, which pays you coupons every every you know month for 10 years. Uh, it's ideal, low risk. Uh, but actually, you probably need, you know, $500,000 just to buy that one bond. Mm. With the ETF, the fund manager is scooping up all those bonds on your behalf and putting them in one little package, which you pay, you know, $50 for. And you get that same exposure. So um, you, along with a lot of the other fund holders, are basically, well, you are literally shareholders of that fund um, that has those bonds in it. So those coupons are paid to you from a number of different bonds. So they're effectively, those fund managers are using their buying power to give you exposure to a number of bonds, which you can then use safely in the core part of your portfolio to uh, drive those sort of yield returns and, and help you stay um, in, in the manner in which you're accustomed during your retirement. Um, then, you know, we have the other side where you've got millennials in their, in their early 30s, but say, say the mid-ground, um, someone like me, um, I'd have a bit of both. So um, I won't have that many bonds um, because I know that I'm going to um, be working for another 20 years. Um, so I've got enough time in the game to take a bit more risk. So if things don't work out for me in the next couple of years um, and some of my investments go down, uh, I've got another 18 years to uh, get that back, right? So I will probably mix that core with some bonds um, and some equities. So I'll have an ASX 200 fund. So I'll be just tracking the Australian market. But I'll probably have something that tracks America. Um, so an S&P 500 ETF, so rather than me buying the 500 stocks uh, or even 20 of the stocks in America, I just take, it's best to think of it is I just take America. I take an S&P 500 ETF mm -hmm. and I've got exposure to, to, to America. Um, and then if you're a millennial, um, you'll probably not have any fixed income uh, because you don't need it. Um, you've got 40 years worth to play, so you can play the uh, vagaries of the market. So you will be picking, you know, Australia, ASX 200, you'll be picking America, and then maybe even things like emerging markets, India, China, um, and you're setting yourself up for a higher risk situation right now, but with the hope that you get a much higher payback um, as you get older and your uh, portfolio has time to accumulate. So that's what the cores look like. Now, the satellites, uh, the satellites are very interesting because this is very based on risk tolerance. So you could be a 70 year old retiree, but you still may have a propensity to take a bit more risk, right? So that extra 20% or that extra 10% of your portfolio that we call satellites, this is where ETFs have really, really um, become popular um, right now, um, where people can take you know, uh, exposure to different themes that would be really tough, tough to do and risky to do um, without the ETFs. So ones like biotechnology, right? So there um, we have a product ourselves with a ticker CURE, um, biotechnology. 
these are the types of companies that are creating vaccines for COVID-19, right? Not all of them, um, but rather than you as an investor trying to pick the winner, um, and there are many losers in biotechnology because it's a very expensive game. And if you're trying to research on a particular vaccine or, or anything really, like a, any particular um, healthcare solution, if you get it wrong, um, or, the, or the FDA, the American regulator, doesn't approve your, your uh, drug, then you cannot go out of business very quickly. So you don't want to be that investor that puts, you know, $50,000 into who you think is going to be the next best uh, vaccine provider that your mates told you um, around, around the table um, last night when you went around for dinner. You don't want that because if you get it wrong, that 50000 is done, right? That's gone for you, right? Whereas with the ETF, you put 50000 in there, you get immediate exposure to more than 100 companies in the biotechnology sector. And some of those companies are really focusing on COVID-19 vaccines um, and you see massive returns on, on that type of a product because it's being COVID-19 boosted. But biotechnology has also done well um, historically for the same reasons, be it you know, cancer cures um, or even you know, tongue-in-cheek things like Viagra. Um, <laughs> you know, that is a biotechnology drug. But that's just one. Um, you can also have things like robotics and automation and AI. Many people know that um, robotics and automation uh, is changing the world, world we live in, right? Um, again, picking the companies that are going to do really well in that sector is very hard um, and you can lose a lot of money. Uh, I mean, just put it, put it in perspective, right? If you are a company that is at the cutting edge of driverless technology, right? Um, and then someone like BMW or, you know, Jaguar or, or whatever the big companies are um, come along um, and they come up with a technology that's better. You as a company, your fortunes immediately uh, go from 100 to zero because you've got this big juggernaut that's actually, you know, executed a better solution. So again, it's better to buy a fund, um, you know, a broad ETF um, that can give you that exposure without you having to think about it. Or even maybe more basic things like FANG. So a lot of um, our, we, we have, we've just launched this FANG ETF. So it's the Facebook, the Apples, Netflix, the Googles, all in one package, right? It's, you know, it's, it's 10, 10 companies. Um, rather than you having to buy themselves, you just buy it in one ETF. The good thing about this is that that ETF um, actually covers core and satellite. Uh, some of the millennials, they will have that as their core because they just believe that those types of technology company, um, and you know, Amazon isn't really technology anymore, it's more like a, it's an online retailer, so the technology aspect is actually a retailer. Um, but those companies are changing the world that we live in, right? So for them, this, this, they will actually make a bet that I will just stick with banks uh, for the next 10, 15, 20 years because I think these companies are changing so dramatically and have got such a stronghold on the way that humans are living the world that I'm, I'm willing to just put a lot of my money in there. For a retiree, I'd say, you know, there's a lot of risk there. Um, so you put that, again, that would be a satellite, same fund. Mm. It's it's such an I, I, reason why I like the core satellite approach, especially when we make, have these conversations, is because it, it, it caters to everyone. So everyone can think of it's almost like two portfolios in one. So you have for a younger person, you've got more of these growth assets, so shares and those types of things, and less of the fixed income and and what have you. And that's in the core. And then for the for the core for the older person, you you might have more fixed income and a little bit less shares. Um, but you still have tactical little portfolios around the outside as well or, or satellites. And you can use them to get that excitement, like you said. So one thing that we always say to, to, to younger people in particular is, listen, if you're, if you're saving for a house deposit, don't put all of your money um, in the share market. But, tr you, well, you, know, you, know, you know, you've got kid, kids, Chris, you know as well as I do. If you say something to someone, don't do this. It's almost the opposite effect. They'll go and do it because they want to do it. So you can... With this core and satellite approach, you can stick to the boring stuff, but you can also have more exciting stuff like the FANGs and, and the Cure ETF, like those types of products which you think, whether it's through your own belief or whether it's some research you did or, or just generally you, you want to make, you want to take a chance at making money on this, you can do that. And it's almost like this is safety, there's the backstop of the core sleeve of your portfolio. You touched on something there, Chris, um, in, the, in your discussion about the core. Um, I was having a, a conversation um, with my mother-in-law not too long ago who was interested in getting into um, ETFs. And 
We started with a very basic core portfolio, which was just a couple of ETFs in shares, you know, in Aussie shares and, and international shares. And then there was a fixed income component too. And it, the way it worked out was that her core portfolio from just these three ETFs was around about 30% bonds or fixed income and 60 to 70% shares. When you think about the core portfolio of the older person or the younger person, what do you think of in terms of percentages there? Like what, what could people maybe kind of anchor on there a bit? Well, uh, in Australia, that's the, the answer is relatively simple, but in Australia, there's a little bit of a twist, right? So, um, and, and it's a positive twist in most environments, but really if you are in the late stages um, of uh, accumulation or retirement, Everything is about protection. Um, and what I see in Australia being, being English is that uh, uh, Australian investors don't protect their portfolios as much as they should. Um, and the reason why is because they've been in an environment where, A, um, Australia's uh, not had a recession for a long time until, until recently. Um, and, and B, you have something called franking credits, right? Which um, every, all of your viewers will know intimately, but doesn't really exist um, anywhere else in the world. Um, in fact, I think the only country that does is Malta. Um, so this benefit um, is intense, um, and and it means that the chance of an Australian investor investing in uh, stocks um, is much higher, um, even in their retirement, um, because they know that they're going to get five plus two percent, right? So you know, if you're going to get five percent yield, you're not. You're going to get seven percent yield um, because mm -hmm. of the tax benefit. Or, or whatever it is, depending on the uh, franking credits at the time, right? Um, so very difficult to ignore. Um, and again, until very recently, until two or three years ago, Australia was one of the highest um, interest rates in the, in the developed world. And the reason I mention that is because um, if you are yield, uh, if you're paying dividends as a company, you need to be paying higher than the available term deposits. Otherwise, all things being equal, an investor will just pick the term deposit because there's no risk, right? So mm. people were, were, were averagely expecting in Australia to get somewhere between 5 to 7% just on the dividends, and then you've got the franking credits, right? Um, really difficult to ignore uh, that as, a, as an investor, even in your uh, retirement. But that aside, um, you know, you should be, um, uh, my personal opinion is that you should be 80% uh, fixed income and cash um, throughout your portfolio, be it core or satellite, um, if you're retired, and only 20% um, stocks, um, notwithstanding the, the point about franking that we've already talked about, uh, just because you don't want that drawdown. Um, you don't want that situation where, I mean, we've just seen uh, what people call in the in the industry V-shaped recoveries in terms of the equity market. I I'm, I'm mystified by this, by the way. I can't understand how a global pandemic, which is just beginning its second wave, and yet, uh, you know, some of the uh, indexes in the world are at all-time highs. It's, it's crazy. But nonetheless, it's happened. Um, but it didn't have to happen that way. Um, and it might change in the future. Um, and if you, you know, you and your partner um, have decided that you can live on 50 grand a year um, and you've set up your portfolio to be able to pay that out, and now suddenly you lose 30% of it. Um, as I said before, you may have to go back to work um, or drastically change your things. You have to not buy that car, um, not go on that holiday. Um, so everything is about maintaining that. Um, and that's why I go 80% at least into cash and fixed income so that you've got a lot less chance of losing um, your money. On the flip side for millennials, it will be the opposite. 80% uh, stocks because, uh, you know, over the court, unless something drastic happens over the course of history, equity markets um, have really gone up um, over and above any other type of um, asset class in time. So if you want your, you know, if you conservatively expect to invest, you know, 250 to $500,000 in your superannuation over, over 40 years, uh, with the if that's mainly in stocks, let's call it eighty percent stocks and twenty percent whatever else, um, just as a sort of a juxtapose to what we said on the re, on, on the retirement side, you can expect that five hundred grand, all things being equal. Obviously, it's being saved at different points every month. It's churning in, but you can expect that to be you know uh, you know a million, a million and a half, potentially more over a forty year cycle, right? So you don't want 
that situation where it's not that you you want to give yourself as much chance as possible to do that and bear all the risks because um, if you're 30 uh, you can try and make adjustments to the portfolio if it's not on track when you're in your 50s um, but give yourself as much of a fighting chance to um, you know make what we call outsized returns returns above term deposits um, you know whilst whilst you can um, and actually there's a real imperative there I mean that, that I'm sure many of your viewers um, know about this but don't think about a lot um, but I think about it um, all the time uh, because it's part of my job to consider it is that things uh, especially for millennials things that uh, were there for our parents um, in terms of defined benefit schemes where if you work for most companies um, especially government organizations you didn't really need to think about retirement too much because they had you covered uh, come hell or high water as long as that company didn't go broke you were going to get a certain amount of money uh, which was dictated by your um, end salary um, to put it very basically and if you had any other pension on the side it was uh, a top up it was like a luxury um, mm. that you could buy a holiday home with or, or whatever you wanted now you have to consider to yourself if you're in a low interest rate environment um, where we are now um, the math is simple. You need a million dollars uh, approximately to earn $25,000 a year um, in perpetuity, right? Um, that's a lot of money to not make much uh, per mm. year. And now obviously interest rates, I hope, will go up at some point and, that, and then that, the mass of that changes. You know, if you're up to a 5% interest rate, a million dollars will give you 50 grand. But right now, you need a big pot um so if you're not taking the risk to get there you might not get there mm. yes there's so many layers to that um insofar as the journey to retirement what happens when you get to retirement your risk profiles one of the things that you you're talking about there and i think we're both assuming this is that the people that are hearing this are longer term investors you're focused on you know longer term goals and well, not even just longer term goals, but you just have a plan in, and a strategy in place and you're using ETFs or just investing broadly as kind of the framework. Um, for example, you mentioned that that shares um, can be more volatile, go up and down year to year as opposed to you know, bonds and fixed income. But and, and a millennial should probably ride that out more, be prepared to ride that out more than, say, an older person because they're exposed to it. But that assumes, I guess, that the person, and we're both assuming here, that the person who is investing in shares and, you know, if it's the FANG ETF, if it's Cure, if it's whatever, in SX200 ETF, we are assuming that they're willing to ride that out. And I think that's a really important point because, yes, um, it, this is, like you said, you broke it down very simply there. That's what you need. And we need to get to that. And the, the best way to get to that is to take some risk if you're a younger person and hold on. So make sure you're prepared to hold on to get to that. Um, but how about, Chris, for people that have a shorter term focus, with so many ETFs coming out now, we're seeing more trading style um, ETFs and we're seeing people think maybe I can trade some ASX 200 ETFs or trade this and that. How about if you have a shorter term focus? Can you still use ETFs? Yeah, that's a great point. So uh, you're right. I've, I've very much focused on on uh, investment strategies today because we're coming from a you know foundational point of view, and mm. um, you know I'm hoping that um, you know a lot of your viewers, uh, as they sort of dip in um, and they do it slowly, they're thinking more about building blocks. But of course, there are people who who, who trade. And actually, the, the exchange tradeability. So we we concentrated on the F part of the ETF uh, for a large part of this uh, uh, you know, uh, interview. But the e ET, the exchange traded ability, it goes to that point about trading. Um, and, and actually ETFs um, exploded, um, positively exploded in America because of their tradability. So mm -hmm. um, and, and America has got a massive ETF industry, so just put it in perspective, um, and I like you know, talking about these figures, um, a lot in these types of um, in, you know discussion because you know they're just big figures. But in the US, the ETF market is around U, uh, three trillion US dollars of mm -hmm. assets under management. Um, and in Australia, um, in US terms, it's about uh, 40, um, 40 billion. 
So, you know, that's, that's the difference um, because Australia has come uh, from, not from behind, it sounds like, uh, you know, re we were regressive, but it's, it's not. It's because we had a big active management um, industry here the, um, and we had big vertically integrated companies like banks uh, that were streaming a lot of our money into their own funds. Um, but the Americans adopted the trading style and it's happening now in Australia. Actually, I just saw a chart from the ASX just recently, um, a couple of days ago, where you can see that the number of trades with ETFs sort of went like this and now it's gone up like that, right? Yeah. And I'm not just talking about in COVID, it's happened over the last year, year and a half. And that's because, uh, sorry? So people are trading more. Yeah, exactly. So, so what's happening is, and it's not just COVID related, although COVID is the most recent experience, but it was, you know, a lot of the people that I speak to, um, I was saying to them, you, you know what, whenever there's a, um, you know, a drawdown or, you know, a correction in the market, right? A lot of Australians, they go, oh, this is a great, great time to buy NZ. This is a great time to buy VHP. I've been waiting for this pullback, et cetera, et cetera, right? So they take stocks. Mm. But I, I did some research with, with my team here, um, pointing over my shoulder. That's where, the, yeah, that's where they are. Um, and we, we, we could show that actually there's a lot of risks there because you can pick, um, you know, let's just say during the, um, the recent um, Hain Commission investigations, right? Um, and, and there was a big pullback in the market at that point um, last year. Um, but you could then pick up a lot of companies cheaply. But a lot of those companies didn't recover quickly. Um, and so, you, you know, you thought you were on a bargain, but actually you weren't getting, it took ages for that to come back to even where it was before before the investigations, right? So what I was saying to a lot of investors, and it's not just me, it's many other people, it's like, why play the companies? Why not just play the ETF? If the ASX 200, which is about 6,000 now, right? But if it goes down to 5,500, don't just buy the companies. If you think it's going to go up, you just buy an ASX 200 fund um, and write it up. Um, and actually, a lot of people have done that with our FANG ETF, right? So, um, you know, we launched that about three or four months ago during COVID, um, and a lot of FANG stocks got smashed, as, as everything else did. But on the ride back up, rather than Australians picking specifically Google or specifically Amazon, they weren't really sure which ones are going to work. Um, no one is, right? So they just pay, take the ETF. And the ETF, you know, has recovered, you know, 30% um, or mm. more. So you're basically playing the market rather than individual companies um, in the market. And then there are, you know, this is much more, uh, and I say this with a caveat, this is much more for advanced um, investors that really know what they're doing and are very into super short term. So that, that's more like a tactical, the FANG one I just spoke about is more like a, mm. you know, a short term, you know, two month thing. And then, and then if it's working out, you just keep it. But then there are trading products uh, which are called leverage products. So they are a fund which contains leverage. And, and leverage means that basically um, for any $1 you earn, um, you're able to earn 2 or $3 within the fund, right? So you only put in a dollar, but it can go up 2 or $3 um, on the day. But it can also go, go down 2 or $3, three dollars, um, in terms of the return profile. Um, so you're in a situation where if you uh, really believe that the market's going to go up, um, you know, we're, we're about to launch some NASDAQ uh, 100 uh, leverage ETFs um, because we know that Australians don't have much technology um, exposure here. Um, and actually within the whole world, most technology companies right now that are listed are based in America. So there is a, there is a NASDAQ fund um, that is just a standard fund that BetaShares has. We're, we're launching leveraged versions of it so that investors that really think that the market is going to go up on technology rather than getting, you know, $1 return for every dollar they put in, they can get 2 or $3, right, depending on the leverage factor that we have. Equally, and this is why it's only for the people who really know what they're doing or have a very, very right, high risk tolerance and a very short-term horizon, uh, it can go down two or, th two or three times as well. So you can put in $100, um, you $130 um, over the course of two weeks, you could equally lose $30. Mm -hmm. um, but these exposures that are, are there um, and they're designed for this new trading, um, um, you know, investors, if you, if you can call them that short term traders um, who want to need to go into the market and take profits quickly, because, you know, we talked about core satellite, but some people um, are actually, you know, um, you know, 
almost professional investors or have a very, very acute view to what's happening short term. And within that satellite, they may actually just go, I'm just giving 10% to myself to take short term returns. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want a product which gives me more kicker. Um, you know, I want to earn, I want to take the risk of losing $30 to make $30. Um, so we're launching those. Beta shares have some as well on um, the Australian index um, and the American index as well. Yeah, as I said, uh, this is where tradability really comes in, where where you don't just have to take short term, sorry, long term core and satellite, but you can also take a trade of one day if you want. It's one of those things um, which is. I'm 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 happy that you put the caveat on there because it is an important thing for people to understand that these do go both ways. But they do have, for particular investors, they do have um, some usefulness and some. And and we saw that during COVID because a lot of people saw that the market was going down, or that they thought that it was going to come back really quickly, um, and and so they wanted to get exposure to that in a certain way. Uh, and, it, and it tends to make sense, as like you said, there's already some products that kind of do this here on the Australian market, but there's nothing for Australian investors overseas. So that's kind of, that's an exciting thing. And we'll put some links into the show notes because I think whenever we talk about any of these things, Chris, and you know this as well as I do, it's important that if you are considering anything like this, go and read the, the product disclosure statement, which is available on the website. We'll put a link to your, to your ETF securities website there so people can read them. Um, Chris, before I let you go, um, I think it'd be worth telling members, Kate, my co-host, isn't here with me today, but she might be in the future, but you'll probably be back um, checking in with us every every three months, I hope. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's been a pleasure. Um, I would also say to your viewers, um, you know, uh, and you're going to put some links in there as well, but uh, every ETF provider I know, um, and especially um, us, we take it very uh, personally and seriously. Any of your viewers should just call us up. There's an info line. Um, you know, we have a lot of information that you can read in your own time. Uh, but I know the other providers as well. If you have any questions, you should ask because we, we as providers don't get enough questions. And I think it's mm-hmm. because people are reticent about calling up and, and not appearing like they know what they're talking about. But we're actually here to help. So the industry is still new. Um, but if you are, are truly interested in all of the things that we talked about, we're here to help. Um, and I know at Rask Finance, you also have um, a lot of information to help investors on this. Yeah. Yeah. I know you guys are working on some things. You've got some webinars, which I'll put some show notes in too. But um, for those listeners of the show, regular listeners will know that um, ETF Securities is the official sponsor of this podcast. So we're, we're thrilled to have you guys on board and to have some like-minded people um, working with us. So Chris, I'll just cap it off by saying thanks for, for taking the time out and, and explaining the world of ETFs and, and some of the more interesting ways to go about investing in them. Thanks, Owen.